Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, if you're on Twitter, you will be aware of somebody called Titania McGrath. She is the social justice warrior extraordinaire. She is the self-proclaimed intersectionalist slam poet. Uh, is many controversial tweets that she's put out. It's meant that she's been deplatformed a couple of times, but she is now in print. In this book, Woke, A Guide to Social Justice, right? Of course, uh, Titania doesn't really exist. She's a fictional character. She's the creation of my guest, I'm pleased to say today. His name is Andrew Doyle. He's a comedian and satirist, and he's also the co-creator of an equally fictitious TV reporter called Jonathan Pye. Thanks very much for coming in, Andrew. Thanks Thank a lot. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we obviously know Titania now. We know. I, I, I would love to know why you decided, when you did, to actually, as it were, reveal yourself. You know, um, I didn't. I was outed. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't Who want. I, you? Um, Steve Bennett at Chortle. Oh, Chortle's right. the comedy industry website. Right. Um, and there had been some sort of mistake where somebody at the publishers, the publishers are uh, Little Brown, someone had accidentally put my name next to a reference to the book in, a, in some catalogue at some book yes, fair yes. in Frankfurt. And somehow uh, uh, Steve Bennett at Chortle got hold of this book and, and connected the dots and that was that. Um, so I didn't want to. Uh, I found it really much more uh, liberating to be hiding behind a persona. Yes. I didn't change the character once I was outed. I sort of I carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, it's just that the difference now is that, of course, one, if I put out a tweet that annoys people, now I get inundated with uh, very angry tweets from people, um, which I didn't before because they didn't know it was me. But it, it, your traffic, as it were, the, the followers for Titania basically grew, didn't they? I mean, yeah. after went up by twenty thousand or something. Um, it went up by twenty thousand when it, she was banned permanently. So there was a, right. there was a um, a Twitter ban. Well, she'd been suspended a number of times. What, what, and what, what over basically? Absolutely nothing. I mean, there were a few tweets which I mean they sent me the Twitter emailed me with the yeah. tweets that they were nervous about, shall we say, and they were completely innocuous. Really, I think they were just had a swear word in or something. Right. I think what it really boiled down to was that uh, they you know Silicon Valley is, is is packed to the rafters with these kind of very woke intersectional yeah. types. And they didn't like someone taking the piss. That was it, I think. And so they, they took it. They took the opportunity to ban her when they could. Yeah. Ultimately, the, the permanent ban came when she 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 attended a UKIP uh, rally and she said she was there to punch people in the name of tolerance. Right. Okay. And they got very annoyed. And they said, I think they suggested it was inciting violence or something, which of course it wasn't. And um, she, I had the email through saying it's it's a permanent ban. You won't be returning. Yeah. Don't try and set up alternative accounts and evade the ban, or we'll, we'll, it will get even worse. And um, then there were lots of people, particularly in America, actually, uh, a lot of conservative uh, uh, figures who were complaining about it and saying, you know, this is a sat satirical account, Twitter, what are you doing? And then within 24 hours, she was back. Um, I had another email saying, we've, we've reviewed it. Yeah. And you didn't violate our terms of service. So is it sort of made, has it made any difference to the way you write it, surely, that people now know that this is not actually a real person? No, it hasn't. It really hasn't. I, I, I still... Uh, obviously annoy people yeah, yeah. Um, but I've what I've just had to resign myself to is that people are going to get annoyed at me rather than the character yeah, yeah. so I mean I have been trolled endlessly by some very angry people they're very upset about it but then if you write a, a satirical thing like this it, it, you know you're going to it's there to entertain some people and annoy others that's its purpose so you know I have to accept that I mean when I first saw it when I, you know uh, on Twitter uh, you know, you have me fooled, actually, I mm. have to say. Because, I mean, I've come across quite a lot of people and you know, argue with people yeah. with those views. I mean, I wondered, you know, in your case, did you know many Titanias? Yeah, loads. It's funny you really? say that, though, because a lot of the critics of it, uh, the people who don't like it, will say, well, it's nothing like real life. You're, you're, oh, uh, no, it, it is. is. This is a straw man, you know, that you're, you're mm. satirising someone that doesn't exist. I'm afraid that's not true. And, and um, that's very much wishful thinking on their part. Mm. But, but she's certainly at the extreme end. Like, she's certainly saying the things that, um, that most people wouldn't say. But the whole woke movement is a minority. It's a very vocal, powerful minority. That's why it deserves to be satirised. Yes, exactly. With this point, I think you've made this point before that, you know, it's a question of punching up, yeah. isn't it? I, yeah, these yeah. people, you know, you talk, I mean, give us a bit of an idea of her profile. I mean, she's an upper middle class girl, isn't yeah, she, yeah. right? So basically she's privileged. Yes. And yet thinks of herself as a victim. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is. And, and 
um, we all know who I'm talking about. We all know those kinds of yes. people. It's so recognizable. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of them are in the media or on Twitter, of course, very vocal on Twitter. I got into an argument. Uh, someone got very angry with me, a columnist from The Guardian, surprise, surprise. And she uh, sent a message saying, well, you're talking about people that don't exist. I've worked at The Guardian. There's no one like, there's no wealthy feminists who constantly go on about being victims. And I said, no, there really, there really are. And if you work at The Guardian, you probably should know in fact, I suspect she's one of them. And then she came back to me saying, no, no, unless you name who they are. And I didn't want to name who yeah, I was talking about yeah. because I deliberately didn't want to make it personal. But she kept pushing. And so I said, OK, there's this person, this person, this person, this person. I listed them. And then she said, well, thank you for that list of the women you hate. You're clearly a misogynist. And that in of itself is exactly why I created Titania. That kind of response. I have no argument left. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to call you a misogynist. Yes, That's all yeah, I've got. Yes, all yeah. I've got is the ad hominem attacks, yes. which is funny to me. That's funny to me. That was hilarious. That was, that was you know, she couldn't have proved my point better. Um, and, and I think, because I used to teach critical thinking, and I think we have to get back, that people don't understand that as soon as you throw an insult, you've lost. That's it, yeah. game over, your yeah. argument's gone. Um, and I, I, I just wish we could get back to that. But Titania is that sort. So Titania will call anyone who disagrees with her a misogynist, fascist often, well, yes, Nazi, yes. racist, anything, just anything, because uh, she knows that those uh, epithets will stick. I've actually got a couple here. That, I mean, the, you know, this one here, I mean, first of all, about comedy, right? Yeah. I think um, she says in one of her tweets, if you find yourself laughing at comedy, it's probably not sufficiently progressive. Mm. Well, I mean, that to me has got, it's entirely true in the sense that, you know, if you think now a lot of comedy uh, is made up of audiences of people laughing to show they're on side politically, yeah, wouldn't exactly. you say? Yeah. You're a comic. I mean, you, you are in, in clubs, you do stand up, don't you? Or, yes, uh, yes, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Would you say that that's correct? I mean, you know, that, that's, that is sort of, it, that's exactly on the money. So that's, that's exactly right, because I think this is something I really hate when I go and see comedy, is if I get a sense that the audience are laughing because they endorse the views that are being expressed, yeah. rather than laughing because they find it funny. Yeah. And I'm guilty of it myself. I think all comedians, if they're honest about this, sometimes when I've done a joke, uh, say I've mocked Theresa May, very easy target, uh, and then people have laughed. And particularly when I was touring on the Jonathan Pye tour and I was doing the support slot, yeah. I had to think now, is that joke really good enough? Or are they laughing because they just hate Theresa May? And if it's the latter, then it's weak comedy. So yeah, you have to go back and rethink it. I, I, what I really loved, though, is on that tour, I was doing a pro-Brexit set to a room full of people, often big rooms of 3,000 people, where virtually no one would have voted leave, or very few, you know. Yeah, and yeah. so therefore, I had to make sure the material was good, yeah. because they'll, they, they won't laugh at someone who supports Brexit unless it's even better. You know, it has to be really, really good. So that, in a sense, is a good thing. But yes, I always mistrust... You see, the people who criticise Bernard Manning and, and sort of old school uh, comics, well, the main criticism, because actually he was a very good comic, um, politically I couldn't be more opposed to him, no, and of course he was a racist, he admitted yeah, to being yeah, a racist, yeah, yeah. and I, I deplore that. But um, as a, as a, in terms of the craft, he was, he was excellent. But a lot of um, the, the people laughing in, in those old clips, you can see what they're doing is they're laughing because they just agree yes, yeah. with, with the unpleasantness of the views. Mm. But that to me is no different than what we see today, which is people from the left, comedians from the left, yeah. making people laugh, and people are laughing because they agree. The material isn't necessarily particularly strong and doesn't need to be. But those two camps are the same. Yeah. So when these people on the left now criticise the likes of Manning and the old Working Men's Club comics, yeah. but they are guilty of exactly the same uh, lack of artistry sometimes. Uh, yes, I've got one here as well. I'm not going to you know, go on with loads of quotes for you because you must get tired of it. But, <laughs> but you know, I think this one I loved. Uh, if you only have sex with people you find attractive, you might want to ask yourself why you're such a superficial bigot. No, I just think, <laughs> but it, I just think that I could imagine people saying that. No, but they, really they, <laughs> they sort of have. Yeah. There have been a number of articles where people have said, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're online Tinder or on yeah. Grinder or whatever, those sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, dating apps. And if you are eliminating people based on certain characteristics, if you don't sleep with people of colour, you're racist. Yes, if you don't, yes. It's like, you don't need to prove you're not racist by having sex with people. Like, uh, <laughs> the, the, people are actually saying this stuff, you know? We all have proclivities, yeah. you know? Are you misogynist if you're gay, a gay man? Are, are gay men misogynist because they won't sleep with women? Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. show some, you like someone and approve of someone by, by having sex with them, do you? Yeah, that would yeah, be an odd yeah. world. But the thing is, the, the, it is it's so spot on. I mean, I. I it's slightly exaggerated, isn't it? 
So it's, it's so slightly, it's, of so course, so it's, so it's yes. absurd, but it, at the same time, it's got that kernel of truth. You could think, yeah. I could imagine that, you know, a time in the future where actually that might be the case. And in fact, you are called this because, for example, you is, don't fancy whatever. This is the either. problem is that I think, unfortunately, often I end up anticipating what people actually say and that really scares me yeah, and it's happened yeah. a number of times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember before Christmas, I did, a, I did it, no, at Christmas it was, I did a thing about the Queen's speech and what she should have said. Yes. And she should have said uh, that, that, that Harry and Meghan will raise their child as gender neutral. Mm. And then there was a story about Meghan floating the idea of raising her child as gender neutral and that was a couple of months <laughs> later. I thought. And then there was the, um, the tweet about Mary Poppins. I did a screenshot from Mary Poppins where she's got the soot on her face. Mm. And Titania said, this is blackface, this is racist. But Mary Poppins is racist. And then lo and behold, New York Times in February says exactly, exactly the same thing. F four months later, comes out and says- I remember the story. I yeah. didn't know the tweet, really. I tweeted about it four months before, saying uh, exactly the same thing, right? And so yeah. that, I should be pleased about that because it makes me happy to be a kind of prophet, yeah. sort of a, a messiah kind of figure, which yeah. is really good for the ego. But, the, but actually it's really worrying and, and, and scary. Um, when, when, you know, reality imitates satire. Now, Titania is going on stage now, isn't mm. she? This is a one woman show. Yeah. Now, so can you tell us about that? This is, this is imminent, isn't it? Pretty imminent, yeah, yeah. it's at the Edinburgh Fringe yeah. Festival, so that's in August. So how will you do that? So how will um, it work? So, you know, I've got a script that I've written and um, still putting finishing touches to it. I like to leave things to the last minute. And um, <laughs> we're casting at the moment, so uh, we'll, We'll see. I, I just I know that we need to get this right. It has to be the right yeah, ac yeah. actor to play her. Um, so we're looking for that young. Um, she's got to have the right look. She's got to be very uh, first and foremost a really strong actor because it's, it'll be more like a play. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, but she's got to be comedically on point. You know, she's got to have excellent comedic timing. So and it will have it will have a story, will it? As it were, or it'll be more, no. It's more like a lecture, like a TED Le Talk style lecture, because right, that's exactly okay. what she would do. Yes, exactly. It's her manifesto. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, going out there yeah. to educate the masses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she believes that's her sort of, you know, God-given duty. Not that she believes in God. Yeah. Um, but you know. But the thing is, with with this creation uh, of yours, and just, it seems to me that it's entirely in the tradition of satire. Going right back to Jonathan Swift, I think he created somebody. You know, it's Isaac Bickerstaff. Bickerstaff, yeah, yeah. Bickerstaff it was somebody he created to make a point about some other issue or some other person. Yeah. But I would have thought. I mean, it's great to see it on social media because I would have thought that satire is a, on the whole at a pretty low ebb in this country. Yeah. Would you say? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there is that tradition, isn't there, of inventing yeah. characters yeah, too? Yeah, you know, yeah. Joe Orton did it when. Um, he used to write letters of complaint about his own plays to the press under the name Mrs. Edna Wellthorpe. Uh, she used to get very upset, very angry. Um, and I think that's a really, I th I'm always attracted to that kind yeah. of thing, that sort of, you know, fake persona. There is a tradition of it. Uh, I always, I'm always wary of talking about that because I'm not, wouldn't for a second compare myself to Swift, you know? It's a, well, no, but I mean, it's a, it's a, tradition. Is, yeah, it's a tradition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, when I say it's at a low ebb, I mean, if you take like popular satire to be spitting image maybe, or private eye as it once was. Yeah. Right, it seems to me now these things, well, there is no spitting image anymore, um, but there's nothing like it. Um, and I worry that, that somehow satire, real satire is actually sort of very, very weak now simply because of the culture which actually you are now satirising. Yeah, I think people, I think part of it is that a lot of people don't know what satire is. Yeah. I think that's part yeah. of the problem. Um, well, how would you define it then? I would say that satire is, I suppose it's when you're attacking or uh, attempting to deflate those in power. Yeah. Uh, when you see something that is wrong in society and you're attempting to fix it by by reflecting back at it. Yeah. Its own, its own vices, its own, its own corruption. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, I suppose the thick of it is a good example of, of very right. strong satire, which right. does right. Uh, reflect and exaggerate to an extent uh, the, the machinations of what goes on in Westminster, right? So, um, whereas comedy is very different, you know, co uh, comedy doesn't need to be satirical. Comedy do doesn't need to have levels of ironic detachment right. to it, you know, and, and I, think that's, I think that's the distinction. Um, she's definitely satirical because, of course, she is embodying a type of person uh, that exists, a very powerful uh, type of person. Well, that's the big difference because the thick of it is about the process. Is yeah. If you're, you're not actually going after the people, oh, well, you are, but, yeah. but it's actually the process of Westminster, which is a kind of easier thing to take on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where you're taking on things, concepts, ideas, current things. Yeah, but maybe that's, 
Maybe that's where it needs to happen uh, online. Maybe it has yeah. to be, because that's where so much of the power resides at the moment, yeah. is, is through social media. Do you think, I mean, so you, you said you wouldn't presume to call yourself a satirist, is that right? No, I mean, I, I did. No, I, mean, I would presume to call myself a satirist. Are, okay. I just wouldn't, I, I just, I wouldn't put myself in, in, uh, in the ranks of Swift, that's all. But I suppose in some ways the difference maybe is... Obviously is, not, is, <laughs> I should say. Is, is, satire, is satire a middle class thing? I mean, you know, if people talk, um, when you talk about comedy now and how comedy is, is uh, the state of comedy in Britain now, yeah. I would say on the whole, it appears to be, um, Sort of what was once called working class comedy or working class comedians are no more. Yeah, comedy's become generally a very middle class thing. Well, comedy or satire. I mean, I, I, I mean, Joe Walton wasn't wasn't uh, middle class. Um, was Chris Morris middle class? I don't think he well, is. Well, um, Joe Walton was nineteen sixties now. I mean, yeah, you're talking okay. fifty years ago. Okay, so you, you mean now in the current yes, present yes, state, yes. Um, comedy's expensive. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, if you go and see stand up, you have to have a. a you, you have yeah. to be, quite affluent, don't you, I suppose? Yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's why audiences are becoming more sensitive. Because right. this whole sort of, you know, offence culture tends to tends to come from the middle classes. Right. Tends, tends to come from people who are quite well off. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why. A friend of mine did say that, actually. A stand-up comic said... Because uh, I said to him, why, why do you think it is that audiences are generally getting more sensitive? Uh, and he said he thinks it's because they're all rich. And, and that's, yes. part of their, that's part of their nature. Yes. You know, I don't know. Do you, I mean, do you find that, um, you know, the reaction to Titania is sort of, um, do, do people f expect you to be a certain type of person? Do they expect you to be politically a right-wing headbanger having yeah. to go at these people? They do? Virtually all of the arguments I have on Twitter, uh, which I shouldn't even engage with, I don't know why I do, are from people who imagine what I am and they imagine wrong. Right. So they have this sort of phantom in their mind of me, of this sort of rabid, frothing at the mouth. Gammon. Gammon, Brexit. <laughs> ang I'm always angry, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, which couldn't be further from my personality, you know. Yeah. So it's, um, and so you end up in arguments with someone who, who isn't even arguing in good faith. You know, they, they're arguing against this spectre of their imagination. So it's actually completely futile. Yeah. So I've started just ignoring them now um, because I've realised this is, you know, I'm trying to defend, uh, they're arguing with Andrew Doyle, this character they've invented, and I'm actually a, the real person, and those two things are not, not in any way similar, so there's no point. Yeah. But yeah, they do have an expectation, and, and um, I think they, they bracket all these things together. If you, if you are seen to mock social justice, or the, the, the manifestation of social justice at the moment, then of course you must be this Tommy Robinson style, EDL style, whatever Sunk, they, they, yeah. they decide you yeah, are. Yeah. And because they're not rational people, you, you can't talk to them and explain the difference because th they will they'll take it in bad faith and say, well, of course you'd say that. Well, where where are you on the general political spectrum then, Andrew? Gen as a, a, you know, personally, where, where, where do your views sit? Um, they if they happen to sit on the left, I suppose. Um, uh, but most of my bedfellows now appear to be more right wingers um, because I'm because I'm pro free speech because I, I detect I know. I know when uh, authoritarianism is on the rise. Uh, right. it's, it's at a very low level at the moment, of course, but it is creeping. And, it, and um, for some reason at the moment, the people who are most concerned about freedom of speech tend to be on the right. I don't know why that was. I mean, you know, the, the ones who are trying to curb people's speech and the ones who complain and want things banned, uh, want people no platformed at the moment, tend to come from the left. Right. Whereas if you go back to the 80s and 90s, they were almost all from the right, yes. the sort of the Mary Whitehouse, yeah, yeah. Daily Mail complaining about the film Crash, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you know, la you know, anything, Last Temptation of Christ, anything, like all of these sort of works. It used to be the right that would rage and, and say, you know, this is, ban this filth is the phrase, right? Mm. But now Mary Whitehouse has won because what Mary Whitehouse has done is, is infected the left. And, and the left are, are now basically they're a troop of Mary Whitehouses. Well, you've made this point, though, in a, in a wider sense that, in fact, you know, identity politics, as as you know, practiced and uh, and promoted by uh, Titania, uh, are essentially kind of re-racializing society. Yeah, right? and in fact, sort of going backwards. I mean, Brendan O'Neill came in quite uh, recently, and he made exactly this point. Yeah, uh, it's all about seeing people through the prism of one characteristic, yeah. isn't it? Now, it's really depressing. I mean, Brendan talks about that a lot, and he yeah, finds it yeah. genuine. He finds it genuinely depressing. This this he describes it as the rehabilitation of racial thinking. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. It's, it's um, I mean, I always think about this. If I go back to when I was a kid, 
And if you watch old sort of Top of the Pops 2 yeah. programs and popular culture programs from, from when I was young, um, you know, for Top of the Pops, for instance, there were often times in the charts where it was predominantly black yeah. artists. Um, TV was was quite diverse, you know. I mean, we watched my, one of my favorite comedy programs was Red Dwarf with the oh, yeah, predominantly yeah. black cat. You know, the two main uh, ca- yeah, two of the main yeah. characters are black, but none of us noticed that as kids. None of us registered it. You know, most of my favorite comedians growing up were female, but I never thought to myself, "Oh, uh, what's the state of women in comedy?" Or, or I never noticed it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And now people notice race and they notice gender and sexuality, and they they watch a play. And they'll see, and they'll say, "Oh, that's interesting. They've cut, you know, diversity. They've, they've fulfilled some diversity. Here. That's yeah. good." But then you're assessing someone in terms of their race or in terms of their. Yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. I think that's a real shame. I, think I, I noticed something you wrote, sorry that you read in, in uh, wrote in Spiked online recently about yeah. critics and what they do now and how they become these kind of political arbiters. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. More than you know, hence criticism as a thing has gone downhill. Yeah, I mean. You know, you only have to look at the reviews of the book. If, if you, you know, if you are politically on side with me, mm. you, you'll find it funny. And if you're not, you won't. Uh, but what very few people are able to do is, is see beyond those political allegiances yeah. and, and assess something on its own merit. And that's a real problem. Um, it's obviously any critic is going to bring a subjective view to anything that they do. Mm. And that's part of criticism, part of good criticism. That's important. But if your politics blinds you to everything else, if you can only see something in terms of your own politics, how closely it matches your own political stance, mm. you're not really in a position to assess it critically. So I don't even consider those people critics. If all they can say is, oh, I don't agree with yeah. the politics of yeah. this film, therefore I don't like the film, I don't think you're qualified to talk about it. Mm. And unfortunately, that's the, that's the case for a lot of critics. Not all, and I really need to emphasize this, there are some brilliant critics who don't fall into that trap. Um, but if you're an activist first and a critic second, then I'm afraid your work is pretty useless. Who would you have admired, say, like, Greg? Where did you grow up, by the way? Where were you in from? In the middle of Birmingham. In, in Birmingham, yeah. right? So, so who would you have admired, you know, I don't know, when you were watching on TV or reading or whatever when it came to satire and humour? Who were the people that you liked? Uh, principally, Victoria Wood was my favourite, oh, okay. um, right. without a doubt. Um, almost to obsessive points, actually, because I, I, I memorised her scripts. So yeah. I, I had copies of the scripts. I watched the, the... I recorded the shows and watched them endlessly. So I... I can still recite those. Um, who else did I really like? It was uh, beautiful re- about, sorry, I have to say, some of the details with Victoria Wood, it was like a, a low camp, wasn't it? It was like yeah. the constant use of, uh, you know, product names, like not just, bis- I could kill for a Huntley and Palmer's, yeah. that kind of exactly. thing. Exactly, it's the specificity. Beautiful. Yes, yeah, beautiful. That's what yeah. she did really, yeah. really well. And yeah. there's something quite northern about that yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, throwing in the detail that you didn't need to have. Yes. Um, <laughs> which is great, you know, she... she uh, and that, that, and uh, there was almost, I mean, the way she wrote was literary, mm. actually. And um, her songs were brilliant and, yeah, just an incredible influence. But, of course, not hugely political, although quite class conscious. People forget this. Mm. Uh, a lot of what she's talking about is, is mocking. Um, she did a brilliant, you know, she, she pioneered that sort of mockumentary format. Oh, yes. Which yes, became... Yeah really normal yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean she was she was doing that before anyone else really she used to have, she had a series called as seen on TV and there were these mockumentaries yeah. within it and there was one about a posh uh, private school girls school and it was really fun they had the you know they were doing the uh, the prize giving day and they had the Oswald Mosley award for whatever you know she, <laughs> these subtle kind of digs um, at that at that whole culture which yeah. is quite a political thing but people yes. don't think of her as political but in a, yeah, in a yeah. sense she was um, Who else? I mean, do, do you, you know, what about the I, whole, you know, if you think of like the, that was a week that was, I yeah. know it's before your time, I, I'm sure, but that kind of thing, would that have interested you? Yeah, I loved the day to day. I loved Brass Eye. I yeah. think Brass Eye is, is incredible. Mm. Um, uh, what else did I read? But I also like, really liked mainstream things. I really liked Friends. Mm. Uh, I've, I've written about that actually because I think it's a really dark, subversive series which people don't give it. Uh, and, how? How come? No, it's pa- it's packaged to this kind of very, <laughs> very mainstream, cuddly, fun yeah. show. But then when you watch it, um, all of the characters degenerate over the series. So by the time you get to series six, all of their funny little quirks have turned into serious, almost psycho- psychopathy. You know, like, I mean, you know, you have, for instance, Phoebe, who's the quirky yeah, yeah. hipster type. She ends up being, she ends up sort of confessing to stabbing a police officer and uh, she mugged Ross at one point. Uh, there's the, the, she's, she becomes mad. You have um, Monica's OCD about cleanliness. Yeah. That becomes absolute insanity where she has to go over to someone's house with a mop and bucket. Yeah, this, yeah. this is unhinged behaviour. You know, and, and there's, there <laughs> is something... passed me by, I'm afraid. Well, also, also <laughs> yeah. from series six onwards, I hate to go on about it, they all lie to each other. 
all the time. Their first instinct is always to lie, mm. to get whatever they want. The show is called Friends, but they just, they just, they, they can't tell the truth to each other at all. You, as soon as Monica and Chandler get married, uh, the whole the show becomes a par- um, uh, satire on marriage because they don't really care about each other. Yeah. They, 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 you know, they, they just, they, they go on honeymoon, but all they want is the free stuff. <laughs> they, you know, it, <laughs> and they used to feed in these very sort of uh, saccharine yeah. uh, moments of very highly sentimental moments, and then they just undercut it and undermine it. Um, and people don't give it credit for that. Part of its effect is that it appealed to such a mainstream audience. Yes. But it was feeding these all sorts of very sort of dark, subversive ideas. I know I'm the only person who thinks. <laughs> that. I'm, 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 I'm processing it at the moment, but uh, no, I, with with comedy now, like perform comedy on TV or whatever. Do, what, what do you like at the moment? Um, that's a really difficult question because I know so many of the people involved. Oh, right. Okay. So I don't, okay. so who, I don't want to okay. mention really who I, because uh, I'll leave someone out. Would you uh, like to be, I mean, I know you do stand up and everything. Yeah. But, you know, you're known for this creation, you're known for Jonathan Pye, which you kind of co created, didn't you? Is it no, I didn't co create. I, I came on board a couple of months after it started. Right. And we wrote it together for three years. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, do you want to put yourself forward more, you know, you, as it were? What, as a stand-up? Yeah. Well, I've been doing stand-up for so long. I mean, I, I just, I, I like performing stand-up when I, whenever I can. I'm doing a week at the Edinburgh Fringe this year, but just one week. Right. Titania's doing the full run. and I'm, um, I think stand-up for me is, is sort of an outlet. It's, yeah. it's, it's uh, uh, something I do, you know, vocationally rather than anything else. Um, I think, for, first and foremost, I'm probably a writer. I mean, that's where I make my yes. money. Yes. Um, you know, and I make money as a stand-up, but but that's not my main. Uh, so, sort of, but you know, I I don't see the two. I can keep doing the pair, the two yeah. of them. I think. Would you create another? I mean, have you got any other characters you're thinking of, or that are sort of brewing, as it were, in your mind? I've got a few ideas, yeah, but I won't say for certain types, for certain, just like yeah, I mean, for certain. Well, I'm type. always thinking. You know, I'm a writer. I create. I write stories. I create yeah. characters. That's yeah. part of it. One of the most amazing things I think to me is. Is the a lot of the vitriol against me is is how dare I put words into a woman's mouth? Right. You know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, this yeah. is a sexist trope of the, the you know you putting words in a woman. But that's called being an author, yeah. creating a character. I'm surprised that people are unfamiliar with this concept. Well, no, I'm afraid it's something we've discussed on this show. We had Lionel Shriver on, mm. and she was talking about actually this is something that's really growing. In yeah, yeah. Writing generally, yeah. in fiction, novels, whatever. You know, that essentially, it's stay in your lane. Yeah. You you can't say, you can't tell anyone else's story. I hate that phrase, stay in your lane. What is it talk? I mean, it's nonsense. I know, it's very it, matey, it, isn't it? it? I yeah. hate it. I, I think it's, you know, do, do they want everything to be an autobiography? <laughs> I, I don't understand this point. I mean, I can write a film. For one thing, like for a lot of the time, we get people complaining that male writers aren't creating enough strong female characters, yeah, street, yeah. strong roles. Well, what I've, I've just written a show <laughs> which is going to be one yes. woman. Yeah. So it's a, it's a major role for one for one talented woman, right? What what more? And yet I'll be criticised for putting words in a woman's mouth, as though the actor has no autonomy whatsoever, as though she can she can't she has no choice but to accept this job. I mean, it's incredibly patronising. Um, when is the show actually on? It's Edinburgh Fest. What are the dates? I mean, people can want to book and go and see it. Yeah, you know, so um, it's from the thirty first of July, thirty first of July, until the end of August, twenty fifth of August. So right. it's it's basically you know through the month. Uh, and you, and it's you, at nine o'clock at the Edinburgh Fringe every night. Nine o'clock. You, mm. you better kind of get to and finish it, from what I can understand. Yeah, I better. Talk, yeah, know? otherwise it'll be really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much for coming in, actually, Andrew. Thanks very, very much. Oh, no, for thanks for having me. All the very best with the show. Cheers. Um, I will say again, we've got the book here, Woke: A Guide to Social Justice. It's very, very funny. Of course, no, it's not. It's terribly serious. I have to take it very, very seriously. Thank you very, very much, Andrew. Thank and, you. Uh, see you next time on so what you're saying is please do subscribe won't you as i say every week thank you bye